delve into the intriguing narrative of Rebecca Zahal, a tale veiled in darkness and intrigue, as we explore the events of September 2nd, 2011, when San Diego Sheriff Bill Gore concluded the death of Rebecca Zahal a suicide and the younger Max Shacknai an accident. Prepare to be drawn into the enigma. So grab your favorite glass of champagne. Make sure your doors are secure and cozy up. For the secrets we're about to uncover are as chilling as they are captivating. Step into the Noir Syndicate to unravel this twisted tale that we call Rebecca's a How, Fate or Fury. This is Inky Noir Champagne Mysteries. Hello Shadow Hunters, Architects of Intrigue and Guardians of Mystery. Welcome to the Noir Syndicate, where we will delve deep into the shadows of the past to uncover secrets long buried. Join us now as we journey through the twists and turns of the enigmatic tales surrounding Rebecca Zahal, Max Shacknai, and Jonah Shacknai. Rebecca Zahau, born on March 15, 1979, hailed from Burmese immigrant roots, originating from Falun, Chin State, a town nestled in the Chin Hills of northwestern Burma. Her parents were Kwa Hni Thong and Zong Tin Par. Zahau's journey led her through Nepal and Germany before settling in the United States approximately a decade prior to her passing. In 2008, Zahau entered a relationship with Jonah Shacknai, the CEO of Medicis Pharmaceutical. Despite being married to Nalipa, Shacknai's prominence in the Medicis earned him the distinction of the ninth highest paid CEO in Arizona with a hefty $6.4 million income in 2010. His personal life was marked by two prior marriages, the first to Kimberly James, which ended in divorce, followed by a contentious three-year custody battle over their two children. His second marriage to Dina Romano resulted in a son, Maxfield Aaron, Max for short, Shacknai, born June 7, 2005. So what exactly kicked off the series of tragic events that ended with 32-year-old Zahau's controversial death? The sequence of events commenced with an episode involving six-year-old Maxfield Shacknai, affectionately known as Max, the son of Zahau's affluent partner, Jonah Shacknai, the visionary behind Medicis Pharmaceutical Corp. Zahau and Jonah had been in a relationship for two years, cohabitating in a sprawling beachfront estate nestled in Coronado, a picturesque resort city perched on San Diego Bay in California. On July 11, Zahau found herself caring for Max while her 13-year-old sister, Zena, was also present in the expansive 27-room residence. Zahau recounted being in the downstairs bathroom when a sharp noise caught her attention, which she initially interpreted 
as either a collision or the barking of a dog, as described in Town and Country's detailed report. Upon investigating, Tahao discovered Max lying injured near the staircase landing, with scattered soccer balls and a scooter nearby, seemingly indicating a fall from the mansion's second floor railing. Notably, a chandelier lay on the ground beside him, as detailed in the police records. In a curious twist, Max's biological mother, Dina Shacknai, confided in journalist Sean Elder, who penned the town and country piece, revealing her deliberate choice to relocate to Coronado due to its reputation for safety, as recounted to the producers of the Oxygen Network's Death at the Mansion, Rebecca Zahao. Indeed, Elder characterized Coronado Island as a tranquil little island paradise. The investigation into Max's tragic demise, handled by the Coronado Police Department, concluded that it was an accident. Commander Mike Lawton of the Coronado Police detailed that Max seemed to have lost his balance while running down a hallway near the top of the stairs on July 11. In a vivid presentation outlining the fall's trajectory, Lawton indicated that Max may have collided with or attempted to grab a chandelier before striking a banister on a landing, ultimately crashing to the floor below. Although the exact call of Max's fall remained unknown, Lawton mentioned the discovery of a soccer ball and the family dog near the stairs. Tragically, five days after the incident, Max succumbed to the brain damage resulting from his injuries. Deputy Medical Examiner Jonathan Lucas reported that Max suffered multiple facial fractures and a severe spinal cord injury, which substantially impacted his heart rate and breathing. Compounding the tragedy, before Max's death was even confirmed, Rebecca herself passed away. Three days prior to Max's demise, authorities found Rebecca's lifeless body on the grass in the mansion's rear courtyard, as documented in the San Diego Sheriff's Department investigative report. On July 12, 2011, Zahao saw Zena off to the airport for her flight to Missouri and then picked up Jonah Shacknai's brother, Adam, who had just arrived from Memphis, Tennessee. That evening, Zahao, Jonah, and Adam shared dinner with a friend named Howard. Zahao and Adam returned home afterward, while Jonah remained at Max's bedside with the child's mother, Dina Romano before eventually leaving to recuperate at a nearby Ronald McDonald house. Reports indicated the presence of loud music emanating from the beach house later that night. On the morning of July 13th, around 6.45 a.m., Adam made a harrowing discovery. To house nude body hanging from a balcony her wrists and ankles bound, her hands secured behind her back. He swiftly alerted emergency services via 911 at 6.48 a.m. and notified his brother via text message. Adam took the initiative to cut down Zahao's body before the authorities arrived. Despite the medic's efforts to revive her, Zahao was pronounced deceased at the scene. Police promptly initiated forensic and toxicology examinations as part of the autopsy to ascertain the cause of death. While suspicions of foul play arose early in the investigation, no DNA besides Zahao's was found on the scene. 
in a chilling detail from the report. Zahao was discovered nude, her limbs bound with red rope, and additional red rope was tied around her neck, along with a blue cloth. Adam Shatnai claimed to have found her hanging and explained to the officials that he had moved a wooden table to reach her and cut her down. Adding to the perplexity of the situation, a cryptic message in black paint was found on one of the mansion's interior doors. It read, she saved him, can he save her? As documented in a San Diego Sheriff's Department report. In a video presentation, investigators demonstrated how Zahal could have tied her hands behind her back using the same binding material found at the scene. The technique allowed her to slip one hand in and out of the ligature while keeping the other secured. When ready, she could place both hands behind her back and into the binding. Reports suggested that just before 11 a.m. on July 13th, Zahao, alone in the residence, began to execute her plan. The exact sequence of events remains elusive, but at some point, she disrobed and tied one end of the rope to the bed's footboard, fashioning a noose at the other end, which she placed around her neck after cinching it. She then secured her ankles together. Moving onto the small balcony, she positioned her hands behind her back, creating the binding, and leaned over the railing. The fall measured nine feet. Failing to break her neck, she lost consciousness within 15 seconds and succumbed about 20 minutes later. Dr. Jonathan Lucas from the medical examiner's office who conducted Zahao's autopsy, noted a significant detail. Her hand still clutched the end of the rope used to bind her wrist tightly. Zahao's DNA was discovered on the knots of the ropes and on one of the knives utilized to cut it. Black paint residue was found on both of her hands and the rope. Additionally, her fingerprints were identified on the paint tube and the second night. Traces of her foot and heel prints were discerned in the dust of the balcony. Zahao left enigmatic parting words on the bedroom door of the Coronado Mansion. She saved him. Can he save her? The autopsy results unveiled four instances of head trauma, sparking various interpretations from the investigators and outside experts. San Diego medical examiner Jonathan Lucas speculated that the non-vertical position in which the how went over the balcony may have caused her head to strike against it during the fall. Forensic expert Werner Spitz suggested a similar possibility, while forensic consultant Dr. Maurice Godwin expressed skepticism regarding the scenario. A second autopsy, conducted by pathologist Dr. Cyril Wecht at the family's behest, raised doubts about the initial findings. Wecht proposed that the fractures in Zahao's throat were indicative of manual strangulation rather than suicidal hanging, leading him to conclude her death was a homicide. The family's attorney highlighted other inaccuracies in the Sheriff Department's investigation, including evidence suggesting possible sexual assault before Zahao's demise. Family members questioned why Zahao's hands and feet were bound. San Diego Sheriff Roy Frank cited instances where individuals secured themselves 
to prevent changing their minds about suicide. Police reenacted the scenario to assess its feasibility, demonstrating a woman binding her hands behind her back with a rope similar to the one Zahao held. A painted message on the door leading to the balcony read, She saved him, can he save her? Further deepen the mystery. While initially not confirmed by the officials as a suicide note, it was interpreted as such by investigators. However, Zahao's handwriting, her artistic hobby, and discrepancies noted by her family cast doubt on its authenticity. In efforts to piece together Zahao's final hours, police obtained cell phone records revealing communications with her sister and a message regarding Max's accident reportedly from Jonah Shacknine, yet the contents of the latter message remained unknown as it was deleted before investigation. Initially, investigators refrained from powering up or operating Zahao's cell phone to avoid potentially erasing evidence stored in its memory. Instead, they sought forensic software tailored to the phone's model. By August 15th, failing to locate such technology, a detective activated the phone manually, discovering the voicemail was not retained. Despite this, they did not pursue AT&T's assistance in retrieving the deleted message from its servers. Subsequently, on September 21st, an investigator announced plans to utilize new technology to copy the phone's data for further analysis. Following a second examination in October, investigators disclosed no additional findings and prepared to return the phone to Zahao's family. During Max's treatment, police consulted with a clinical social worker, Ray Teetsworth, at Rady Children's Hospital, who remarked on the unusual nature of Max's case due to his cardiac arrest post-fall as per police reports obtained by Oxygen.com. In 2018, a civil jury held Adam Shacknight legally accountable for Zahao's death, though he was never criminally charged. Throughout the civil trial, arguments presented by Greer alleged that Shaknai assaulted Zahao, strangled her, and staged her hanging to appear as a suicide. Shaknai denied these accusations with his attorney, asserting the absence of evidence supporting his involvement beyond his presence at the property at the time of Zahao's death. Following the civil verdict, the family urged the Sheriff's Department to investigate the case as a homicide. After an extensive eight-month review, the department concluded once more that there was insufficient evidence to suggest Zahao's death was anything but a suicide. Subsequently, Greer and the family redirected their focus towards the medical examiner's office. A petition forwarded to the office contested Zahao's death ruling, citing a wealth of evidence and expert analysis indicating foul play. This evidence included expert testimony pointing to the potential scene cleanup, similarities between knots used in Zahao's binding and Shaknai's professional knotting expertise and handwriting consistency between Shacknai and the door message. Adam Shacknai recounted to investigators finding Zahao hanging from the mansion's second story balcony on July 13, 2011. He promptly called 911, retrieved a knife from the kitchen to cut her down, 
and attempted CPR in an effort to revive her. San Diego County Sheriff Bill Gore in 2011 declared Max's death a tragic accident and Zahao's death a suicide, dismissing the notion of criminal conduct in both cases. Shadow Hunters, journey with me into the shadows of queries and speculation. How does the sound of a falling boy resemble that of a barking dog? Shadow Hunters, ponder this peculiar auditory mystery. How did the scattered soccer balls and scooter end up atop Max's leg if he purportedly fell off the banister? A puzzle for the sleuths among us. Can one truly run and flip over a banister without any indication of structural failure? A perplexing conundrum indeed. Why was Rebecca found lying on the lawn before authorities arrived? Could this relocation be linked to the tampering with evidence or does it hide a deeper truth? What purpose did the loud music serve on the fateful night? A curious coincidence or a deliberate distraction from impeding events? She saved him, can he save her? Delve into the enigmatic depths of this cryptic message, Shadow Hunters. Who is the savior and who the saved? How could Sahau's ankles be tied while she purportedly made her way to the balcony? A tantalizing question for the astute investigator. In a case laden with DNA evidence, how can one discern truth from manipulation? Shadow hunters, tread carefully through this maze of evidence. The absence of a suicide note and the presence of head trauma raise doubts. Can a death truly be labeled suicide in the face of such contradictions? Did power and privilege play a role in shaping the investigation's outcome? Explore the shadows of influence that loom over this perplexing case. Why was the deleted voicemail message left unexplored? A tantalizing hint lost in the digital ethers awaits discovery by astute investigators. Shadow hunters, as you ponder these enigmatic questions, the truth lies obscured in the shadows, awaiting those brave enough to uncover it. In the hushed corridors of justice, where shadows of doubt loom large, one final question remains suspended in the air, begging for resolution amidst the swirling mists of uncertainty. As the curtain falls on this saga of tragedy and intrigue, we are left to wonder, was justice truly served? Or did the truth become entangled in a web of power and privilege? In the echoing halls of the mind, where whispers of conspiracy linger, the story of Rebecca Zahau and Max Shacknai reaches its dramatic crescendo. Yet, as the final credits roll and the curtain drops, the enigmatic riddle of their fates remains shrouded in darkness, awaiting the intrepid souls brave enough to venture into the depths of mystery and unravel the secrets that lie within. So, Shadow Hunters, as we exit the labyrinthine corridors of intrigue and deception in the Noir Syndicate, let us raise a glass to the fallen and toast to the enigma of inky noir champagne mysteries where truth 
is the elusive prize and justice the final destination. Good night.